What is going on, guys? Welcome to the Wednesday Night Live stream. Tonight, we have on the one and only Robert. How the heck are you, buddy? I'm real good, Devin. How are you, man? Excellent. Thank you. So kind of on point for today's topic, we'd figure kind of overhauling tanks, tank makeovers. You have, you know, LG issues, something you want to deal with, kind of reasons that you'd want to reset a tank or bring it back to its glory days again, more or less. Figured it'd be a good topic for the day. I think, uh, you know, once you've been doing it for any any extended amount of time, like you end up overhauling a tank. Um, And it's it's not even necessarily that you neglected a tank. It's just... uh, you know, after a couple of years, tanks could really benefit from it. You end up, gosh, you end up changing the rocks around. You got to get rid of some algae. There's all kinds of reasons that you'd really want to go in and rip it apart and clean it up, you know? Yeah, I find, I, I see a lot of posts about people that just, you know, they've had, they don't like the rock escape or it was like, you know, zero experience is to pile of rocks, right? They want to mix it up. I do see that one quite yeah. a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I've done it for, usually it's because I want to move the rocks around and corals grow in and like, I don't want to lose a coral that's getting isolated and I got to move it around. Usually it's like that whole real estate thing going on, but I've definitely done it for algae. I've done it to find, you know, a problem child type fish yeah. <laughs> or animal. Um, and yeah, pests too, like, you know, trying to get rid of an aptasia problem or bubble algae. I remember I did it once for bubble algae because yep. it's just easier to get it out of the tank, you know, so I- handle it. Ironically, that basically sums up my, my most recent experience, which is my first time. I, I'm going to say that I've reset a tank. And mainly, with the, the funny thing it was, it was mainly because of Aptasia. And I'm just impatient. Um, now, it happens. Yeah. Easier to get it, man. I'll give you that. <laughs> but the, the funny thing is, like, I had this battle, like, six months or <clears throat> like a year ago. You know, and I F-Aptasia, I got it. It was like 95% gone, and then the tank just got neglected for a few months, and then all of a sudden I looked at it one day and it was just like covered out yeah, of nowhere. That's, that's the worst, man. Like when you, I don't want to say half-ass it, because it's not necessarily that. It's just like you miss a couple, and then the problem comes back, you know, tenfold. Like, man, that, I'm yep. kind of, it's not a terrible problem right now, but so I went in and with my own tank, and I took a, a like razor blade, scraped it, like, you know, really got my hand in there and did all the walls there nice and pristine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I should have, and I know better, I should have changed the water with this, but I didn't change the water right after it. Um, you know, I got the filter roller. Everything's fine. Parameters are great. You know, nothing, the, the coral are happy. But I should have, it had been like three weeks, I think, since it changed. And now we're, we're probably on the fourth or fifth week now. But I just, I didn't change the water, man. And within seven days, like I'm almost back to the same point. And I'm like, yeah. I'm down there. Like I make a point to it to go with a magnet scraper every day to try to, I was three days. I missed it, man. And already the crusty stuff was building up Oof. worse than it was before. Yeah. Really? Oh, I was so mad. Yeah. I mean, it was just, you know how it is, man. It's just, it, I got some of that bright green, like crystalline stuff that that's coming and caking on. And for whatever reason, it came back faster than it grew initially. Really? Um, but now I'm getting coral and algae too. So that's another battle. Uh, yeah. Now is, yeah, just coming back tenfold. It's frustrating. <laughs> now, is that a good thing or a bad thing for you, the coral and algae? It's good. Uh, yeah, I hadn't. So up until recently, maybe two and a half months ago, I, I wasn't dosing anything. I use uh, Tropic Marin Classic, so the parameters are high right out of the bucket. And I was pretty adamant about, you know, regular water changes. But now that the, you know, I've, I've got it stocked pretty well. It's stable. Um and there's some LPS in there that are growing, you know, um, I have some Ophelias and different things. So I just wanted to make sure I tested for about six weeks every week. And I noticed the alkalinity would, would drop out, you know, it started between nine and 10 after the water change. And then by the time I would go around to a water change, I'd be right about 7.5 to 8. Mm-hmm. So it was just too much of a drop for me. I didn't want to fluctuate that much. And pH was low because I have it downstairs in the basement. So yep. started dosing. Long story. Started dosing. And yeah, as soon as I started dosing, man, uh, ESC, Bionic, and then um, I use some some BRS stuff if I run out Bionic. But uh, as soon as I started dosing, that coral and algae popped its head up. Yep. So it was interesting, too, because, I mean, you know, the levels weren't terrible, but it's just like as soon as I started dosing, you know, the coral and algae decided to grow. And previously, it didn't, I mean, there was not a even a tiniest little speck of coral in the tank, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, quick shout out, fellow reefer. Thanks for the super chat. Um, he asked, how are you dosing kelk in your tank? I noticed dosing frequently with high pH affluent helps rather than waiting for hours on hours. Okay, so I I just dose it 24-7. Some people will only dose it at night, 
but if you just do a consistent drip rate with it, then it will just bring up your baseline of pH overall rather than just trying to bring it up at nighttime. Um, that, and I find then it's not really going to swing your other dosing parameters. So I personally, I think just a slow, consistent drip 24-7. That's my personal preference with Calc. How about you? Any preference? Yeah, I always do a, a constant dose. Yeah, same thing. You know, a little drip. Yeah, I, I would... I used to, so there was a time where when I was running a calcium reactor where I'd alternate. Um, so I'd run the calcium reactor during the day and then the calc wasser at night. But the last time I did calc wasser, which I, I did it a little bit in the beginning of this tank, actually. Um, and yeah, I just dosed it. I only did it for like a month and just realized I didn't really need it. So then I turned it off. But if That's I was fair. to tell somebody or recommend how to do it, I would say, Mix it in a separate container. Don't put it in your ATO and drip it into the tank, whether you gravity or use a dosing pump. Um, you need a good sort of good quality pump to get that consistent drip. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, where it doesn't slow down or speed up on you. But uh, I would I would dose it separately over any of the, even over a stir. Uh, stirs are nice because you don't have to maintain them a lot, but they end up just being such a pain in the ass, man. They clog up and you got to, you know, you're still in there once a week having to, you know, uh, add new water to it uh or add more calc wasser and you can only add so much before it just gets all nasty and you're not really there's probably a benefit there when you're you're maxed out or like right at your baseline of saturation um but i don't know i've always just had the best luck dosing it separately and all day long yeah um, yeah if yeah. i Deal situation, I mean, if you had the budget for it, um, either a Camor or a Versa, just one of the continuous duty pumps, and just suck straight from your ATO and just let that drip in. Then your ATO will run less, and, you know, it's going to be super consistent, which I think is key to it being nice and easy and stable. All right. Okay, so for resetting the tank side of things, um, so for me, my AK this weekend was mainly because I had all the Aptasia, Again, I didn't want to write off the corals because there's still lots of nice solos and stuff that are hiding under that sea of Aptasia. So I actually put them all into a temporary tank, which is on the floor beside me. And what all... was it? What did you put in the temporary tank? Fish? Zoas. Oh, Zoas. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. T yeah. T tons of Zoas under a sea of Aptasia. So we actually had Buddy came over one night and we like scrubbed a bunch with a little toothbrush as we took them out, just to, like take off all the big ones. And we threw them all on there, and then as I was taking stuff out of the tank, I all every time I found the Bergia, there's probably like 10 of them in there, I would just suck them up the little tricky baster and put them in that tank. So hopefully I'm just going to leave them there for a month, they can deal with the Aptasia, and then I can move those corals back into the tank. And then the fish are living behind me on a bin on the floor. So that's so why. You, dr you drained and emptied the tank completely? Yep. Obviously. So yeah. I... I drained it probably about 90%, and then I refilled it. I was doing the buckets, and I'm like, wait a minute, I have the python. So then I got the python, put that in, drained it out, refilled it, and then I dumped in copious amounts of citric acid, which is magic. Recall. Oh, in, into the tank? Yeah. And that brings, that brings up a good point, though. Uh, you know, with an overhaul, you, you can't do it without having to, like, break the tank down. Um, but you just have to be much more meticulous than you would if you take the approach like Devin did where you would pull everything out into buckets, use the same water, but fill buckets, put the fish, uh, you know, in a bucket, make sure it's oxygenated and moving water. And then you get your corals in a separate one. And then at that point, you know, corals and fish can live in those buckets for multiple days, as long as you keep the temp and the, and the oxygen steady. Mm -hmm. So plenty of time for you to drain the tank, pull the sand out, scrub your rock, fill it back up. Um, the thing you just, the only really, the biggest thing you have to be careful of is keeping the rock alive, you know? Yeah. Um, and just like a fish, you'd want to put that in a, a bucket of oxygenated or moving water. Exactly. Uh, so, so, yeah, yeah but like both my containers both have heaters. They both have power heads in them. They both have lights on them, even because I have coral in there as well. So it's basically a tiny tank. Um, right. Now. That, that's something people ask a lot, though, is they, you know, and I, I guess it is concerning, but they'll live in a bucket just like a tank for quite some time, you know? A tank is a bucket, don't, just a fancy don't bucket. Them, don't put nutrients in there. Like, I wouldn't feed them at all, really. Yeah, I still feed them, just a little skimpier than normal. How but, long are you going to leave them in there? Um, I might move the fish in soon. So I added, okay, so basically the one reason I decided to nuke it is because I knew, you know, bubble algae, aptasia, stuff like that would live in the pipes and other places you're not going to get to without 
more drastic cleaning measures. Sure. So, Thanks, yeah, I basically refilled. It was probably 80, 90% fresh water after that. And I dumped in like seven, eight pounds of citric acid, just like copious amounts of it. And then I let it run overnight. And then the next day it came with it, or like a scraper, and it literally like all that caked on stuff just came off like nothing. It was like paper. So, yeah. yeah. And redrained it, refilled up the RDI, added salt. And then last night I escaped it. So it's looking pretty good now. And then added sand. Um, the aqua forest sand came with some bacteria. So I dumped all that into the tank. I dumped in some Microbacter 7 last night. And then today I took some media bricks out of my water box and put that in the sump. I also have the original bricks that were in that thing, keeping the, t- the whole tank before. Since it was more of a frag tank, I didn't have rock in it, right? So I have all those bright roll bricks, all that stuff, like in my temporary container, so I can move those back in. So I should basically have all the bacteria I had before, plus some coming back into it. And yeah, you'll be able to, w- with that, you'll be able to put the fish and everything back in and sort of in- insta cycle in yeah. a sense. Um, so that's good. That's and that's a, a good thing to note is when you do this is, you know, maintain or keep some of your biological media or rock, either yep. or both, keep it alive. And then when you set the tank up in again, three, five days later, or however long it is, your your biological foundation should be stable enough to to handle everything right away again. That's as long as you know you, you keep it alive. Hundred percent. And d- keeping your good bacteria alive is probably one of the biggest considerations when you're doing this. Um, especially if you have a bunch of rock. Like you need to keep that rock wet. You don't want it to dry out. If you're using, you know, like bright roll bricks or media bricks, you want to put those, same thing, keep those wet. Because that's, that is all your cycled good stuff. Yeah. Now, I didn't and have... scrubbing, if you're scrubbing the rock and salt water, that's okay. Yep. <laughs> I do, I, I used to do that a lot when scrubbing them is, I do it during a water change. You pull the water out, you've got your 20 gallon thing, and then I pull out a handful of rocks, to scrub the shit out of them in that, in that yeah. bucket, you know, dunk it a few times and right back in the tank. So the rock stays alive, you get a clean rock, yep. um, and you're not you know, mucking up your tank. <clears throat> now, I've, now, I've seen people do this. This actually worked well with, um, like, hair algae and stuff that was just nasty, where you, again, you, like, you scrub it off physically. If you can pull the rock out, give it a scrub. Um, and then what I would do is dump something like hydrogen peroxide on it. So oh, yeah, that's going to kill off all the roots of the algae. Now, and the rock stays alive. Which is well, I don't know about that fully. Um, because you will probably kill off some of the bacteria with the hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, but it's on the surface. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, you're not dunking the whole, this is my point. You're not dunking the whole rock in, like, you're not submersing in hydrogen peroxide. You're, you're hitting the patch of algae. Mm-hmm. That's growing. You kill it, and it'll, it'll burn it or kill it instantly. And then, to an extent, you still have a living rock that is probably still going to benefit your, your, you know, your beneficial bacteria foundation. Now, if your whole tank is covered in algae and you're doing this, I would basically... Pick, you know, maybe a rock or a small chunk each week and break it up so you do not lose too much good bacteria. Um, that's if you're, like, taking it out and dousing it with peroxide or something just to 100% kill off all that algae. If you're doing it in tank, um, turn off all your flow, put some in a syringe, and just spot treat. And usually one mil per 10 gallons is a safe amount, and that's what I've done in the past. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to kill it, you might as well bleach it, right? I never actually use bleach for killing stuff like that. It it does it, man. <laughs> I believe it. it. Turns the rock white and kills everything. Yep. All right. People wanted picks or didn't happen. All right. Sneak peek of the tank. So kind of see behind me. This is super shallow. I'm not going to lie. It was a bit tricky. Sorry, Robert. You can't see. Um, it was a bit tricky to scape the tank because it's only 14 inches deep. And I still want to leave lots of room for acro and everything to grow on top of it. So I've been playing with lots of cool different structures. So this is, yeah, I, I've been filming as I go, so it'll probably be next Monday's video, the whole process of it. But, yeah, overall, it's definitely getting there. So it's a whole new tank now. It went from frag tank, and I'm turning into a shallow reef display. So pretty stoked for that. Oh, that's cool. Are you, do, you, do you have another tank that's frags, or are you just are no, you done? I, I don't really sell tank? frags anyways, and I'm like, a display is more yeah. fun. No, the oh, other... yeah, totally. I would agree with you with that, man. Having, well, building the display out the yeah. fun part. But then when you need a frag tank, it's you need a frag tank. So Now... <laughs> I also yeah. have a sump with a two by two section and all my extra rocks currently down there. So I'm going to turn the sump into a second tank. And I remember that, you, I saw a post or something you, you posted yeah. about it. So I had, I had the Focustronic light. So that one's mounted in the sump mm. and I'm going to let, I'm going to let that one be automated where it can scale itself up and down and play with all those features on there. And that might be a display slash frag. So I think that'll be kind of cool. And then the other random thing I kind of decided to do is on this tank, I'm going to, I decided to do it completely different from my main tank. 
like just because you know either for content or experimentation whatever so you know like i'm using calcium reactor i pulled this calcium reactor off for now i pulled the calc off for now and i'm doing completely different methods than i did on the other tank just to mix it up so i think that'll be good well what method are you going to do uh, i'm just going to do dosing for now um i do have the dose tronic which i had on my old lagoon tank and i still tweak it i never fully let it automate dosing for me but i'm actually going to try that now i'm going to finally give in after like three four years and let let it it auto dose and auto tweak itself and yeah so before i i just use it to test i'd badly tweak stuff myself but i'm gonna give in and i can just let it do it so but my my goal is to have two completely different methods in each different tank yeah no that's awesome and you'll have a side by side and you'll also be able to compare like the effort and you know not just the results but what it takes to get the result you know Mm -hmm. so but yeah so i think it will be good um, how many gallons is that bad boy? I think it's around 160 ish. It's seven foot six long, 28 front to back, and 14 inches deep. Good size. Big and that is a good size. That yeah. is a good size. That's going to be a real cool looking tank. I think so. I'm pretty 14 easy. inches tall. Yeah, it's yep. going to be neat, man. You'll pretty... be able to. What do you do for flow? I have four MP40s on the back wall shooting back to front. Oh, interesting. But they're only running at like 20% right now. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, it definitely would move everything. Um, mm-hmm. But in a long tank like that, you usually think you do a, a left to right setup. But that's cool. Yep. It keeps it off the viewing panels, you know? Yep, so nothing on the viewing panels, and then it kind of creates that whoosh flow. So. I was going to say, when you, if you had the frag racks in there, that would have been a super beneficial way to do the flow because you can top and bottom. Yep, exactly. So that's my current experiment. Uh, okay, so if you are going to do... Oh, yeah, top downs are amazing. The scape looks super cool top down. Um, that was my main thing because I'm like I'm gonna be scared. How high off the ground is the top of the tank? Only looks like four foot, mm. four and a half. Yeah, probably. I don't know our tape measures. Yeah, so plenty low enough where you can look down upon it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Stomach level. <laughs> four, yeah, four foot. Yeah, that's cool. So then you get a cool top down view and you're just standing up. Yeah, so it'll be pretty cool. It'll still look good from the side. So I'm stoked for it. Um, the other kind of funky thing I did is a lot of those flat, flat base rock ones. I use mm-hmm. those as part of the scape, so I just let them start to come out of the sand, and I'll use that to mount stuff as well. So it gives you right, more but it'll still, but still that like little bit above the sand, right on the sand. But you have a foundation to stick it. Yeah, no, that's smart, man. Um, I'm, I'm doing something similar right now. I need a place to put some zoas, and uh, yeah, actually, I think I'm going to cut a rock to to make it flat to where I can put it in the sand bed, and then I can mount the zoas on it. But it's like I need it way down in the sand. It's just I don't have a good way to to make them st- you know stay down there because you just do the plug and it ends up getting covered in sand or tossed all over so i'm gonna make a little dome you know that's no it's a great way to do it i that's i actually really dig the little basey ones because you can make little islands and it's just enough to keep them out you know half inch out of the sand they don't get buried and it's easy to mount yeah. to right yeah and they don't look funky either or anything though the, the sand butts up nice against them exactly so it'll be good okay so bacteria is important oh completely random note what's in my head um, cause I did the DNA testing on my tank. Oh, really? So cool. Super cool. Um, and one of the things that he said is like my water box had an extremely diverse bacteria, like super duper diverse. So today that inspired, I mean, there's a little bit of bad in there, but it was like 95% good. So I got, um, I just used a pitcher of water and I kept taking a pitcher of water back and forth between the tanks to bring some like the good water from my other tank in. That way my tank gets a mini water change. It's right? changed sand, man. Well, I took a handful and did it. Yeah. Did a handful of sand. Um, I had those pull-up lab little brick things that I got, those super dense ones. I had oh, four yeah. of those in the sump that's been in there for the last month, so I just moved those in. And that'll, then, be, that'll be alone. That should be enough, you know, I'd imagine anyway. Yeah, and I had a bunch of those little eShops Biolux, those little skinny ones, and I put those between my baffle, two rows of those. So those have been in my tank for like a year, so those will be full of good Dude, bacteria. The bacteria soup, man. There's you betcha, something, man. Something about bacteria soup. We just gotta we gotta figure out what's the what's the perfect recipe, you know? <laughs> oh, that's funny you put that in there. Okay. So super speaking this it's totally off topic, but um speaking of bacteria soup and <laughs> One of the random things, there was DNA of like a frog or so, something like that in one of my tank. I was like, what? How is that even in there? I don't even know yeah, frogs. Jurassic Park going on, man. I do. Filling in the DNA gaps with frog DNA. I know. It's weird. <laughs> hey, if it works, it works. But yeah, it was super crazy. 
That is interesting. Yep. I'm going to have to bribe Eli to come back on and go in his in-depth analysis of the DNA and everything. Yeah, man. It's super interesting. And there's not a ton of content out yet. So exciting in the next couple of years what's going to come of all that, you know? Exactly. Um, Did you get both? Because they do like the, the biome test and the DNA test, right? Yep. Do you want do you yeah. want do you want to hear my email? Is sure. okay. I'll read it to you. Is this like his personal summary? Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay. So like uh, all right. So here here's the full rundown. Here's all the dirt on my water box. Uh, writing writing to follow up personally on the automated email and share my perspective on the reports. The microbiome test showed your tank as a diverse community with an unusual composition. Some of the difference between your tank and the typical community can be explained based on the details you provided with your sample registration, the low levels of pathogenic, or pathogenic, I don't even know what the word is, are likely the result of the UV sterilizer. In fact, this such thing has a strong effect that I'm surprised I see groups in your sample. Now, I, I actually haven't been running my UV for a while, so probably why. Even though these levels are low, I wonder if the flow rate, what the watts are, how it differs from others. Um... Buzzle bacteri is often promoted in tanks, dosing carbon containing other probiotic yeah, probiotic products. I see you're dosing a variety of products on dosing pumps. One of them might be contributing for this effect. Your sample also has several oddball groups. I'm not sure if I've come across before. Rumen osoakake are anaerobic and usually associated with a gut microbiome. In your sample, that included Osteospray SP, a component, a, a component of the butt microbiome, along with other unclassified members of the family. I see reports of this group enriched by probiotic use. I suspect one of the products you're dosing might contribute to this, but I have no idea which one. Uh, hmm. Nitrifying community looks great. Many of my clients would envy these levels. Yes. Um, there are some variations of the, the communities, which... Uh, we, the hobbyists, expect. I think this is driven by the competition between different processes for the ammonia and nitrate we usually think are being fueled for nitrification. And the tank is impressively free of bacterial pathogens. Some of the fifth pathogens only show up about 50% of the tanks, and some recently descri described suspected coral pathogens show up in 10 to 20%. So not having any of these is a nice result. Um, and now... For uh, and not all foregone for conclusion. Okay, now for the tank DNA test. Um, the headline here, the presence of uranium in your tank. Tech, the test actually found two different species, the common U uranium that causes disease. Now that's the chromus one from my understanding, which I do mm -hmm. have one chromus in there and he's fine, so that's good. And the other, the U elegans, which to my knowledge is not a problem for fish. That's good. Uh, the most common detected... Parasite in our tests appearing in 10 to 20% of tanks, depending on how you count it, so you're not alone. If the tank persists, though any signs of disease existing in the fish, I expect the case may be that it's there, but there's no active infections. You're in the living off bacteria instead. But unexpected parasite in the tank can account for deaths of newly acclimated fish. I've had no issues there, so that's good. Um, also found some diatoms down of flanagets, like most reef tanks, but neither appear at levels that would suggest any problem. The only surprising thing, a small amount of DNA from amphibian, which sometimes kept as pets, a fire-bellied toad. Contamination in the lab is extremely unlikely for this one, since it has never showed up in a sample, including, <laughs> including anything else in this batch. Any chance you have one of these? Which I don't, so that's super weird. But hmm. anyway, anyways, the moral of the story I was agree. super diverse, awesome bacteria, which made me happy because... No, moral of the story is fire-bellied toad and where did it come from? Maybe that could be the magic. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. But yeah. So anyway, so once I read that of like how, you know, surprised he was of like how diverse my tank was compared to the most. Yeah. Was, I'm like, all right, I'm seeing as much meat as I can and trying to siphon to this tank to hopefully bring it's over that. cool, man. Like, you know, never before could we have gotten that kind of evaluation of the tank and been able to quantify or think about our tanks that way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just cool like you're putting a score level to it now you know um and then to see the results of that and then you know the next next step is like okay how do we manipulate this to target for you know like what is the biodiversity we need to to overcome a particular pest or something like 
Mm-hmm. Or, uh, you know, dinoflagellites, like there's got to be some sort of, you know, balance or particular diversity, like ratio of bacteria we need to achieve to compete it out. And then once it's gone, like now we can level things back out and, you know, focus on this other stuff. But how do we focus on those things? It's just exciting. It excites us. Oh, so it's, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> and yeah, neat. yeah. So bacteria diversity is huge. Um, and now when I originally did the live stream with him, I literally had like, I had a bag of Miracle Mud. I don't know if this how much is related. And I also had a bag of the Aqua Forest Mud. And literally after that stream, I went and dumped them both into my sump. And, and this, and I'm like adding all of these random things to introduce new bacteria. So who knows if that's related to it? It very well might be, but uh, yeah, it just made me laugh because I did all the stuff and I did the well, test you, a few weeks later. You buy coral from all over the place. Like you've brought in a lot of coral yep. from the U.S. and different corners of the U.S. So you know, I could be adding a that. Ton. Yeah, like. You got to think 90, maybe say 80% of the tanks, like people do order online. So that's mm-hmm. a way. Yeah. Um, but you think like a lot of guys are getting most of their stuff locally, you know, or from local reefers and whatnot. Mm-hmm. I, I guess I'd be interested to see sort of the ratio of uh, corals that come from online in different places versus what's bought locally. But it's true. I don't though. know. Just something to think about because I know you, you travel and bring coral home, you know, and mm-hmm. you've been doing it for a while. Yeah. And that's- yeah, you've got coral have been with you for a while too so. that's a good point that probably is a huge chunk of the diversity you know each one of those frag yeah. plugs or front chunks or whatever from all over the place would be adding up so right variety is spice of life all right so other reasons okay so you, you want to rescape your tank um you want to get rid of a pest you got your bell bulge you aptasia anything like that um tanks neglected that's actually that's another good one right if you have neglected the tank there's LG. I mean, or cyano it just it needs love right i've seen many tanks like this the cyano one cyano is, thankfully is not the hard the one that really gets me are things like i guess it's the pests like the vermitid snails the aptasia um a hair uh, like a hair or a turf algae uh like stuff you just can't get with repeated like removal you know like no matter how much you try to get hair algae out of your tank like there's gonna or turf algae like if there's gonna be a tuft that just keeps growing back Mm-hmm. And you you got to just rip the rock out and, you know, hit it with the prox, scrub it, hit it with the peroxide to get it out of the tank or kill it for good. Um, Other thought, you could yeah, you yeah. could drain your tank down, put some peroxide in the spray bottle and psh, 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 all over the bad yeah, spots. Yeah, I remember you talking about that one, just a little spot treat it that way, which yeah. seems to work. You just, uh, you know, technically speaking, it's safe to add peroxide. You know, it's not poison to the water. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it just, uh, like, increases dissolved oxygen. I, I know we used to use it. Um, as sort of an emergency way to oxygenate the tank uh, when the when the filters were good at the pet store. I worked for a big pain chain pet store for hmm. uh, quite a few years Which when one? I was young. Uh, PetSmart. Thanks. Well, I worked for PetSmart and Petco, but most of the time I was at PetSmart. Uh, was 17 years old to 21. Huh, that's so, pretty cool. I didn't yeah, know about this. Live pet care manager. Pet nice. care manager. Um, anyway. So like we always would keep gallons of peroxide on hand. So if the the filtration system, because they're the tanks you see there are all connected. Yeah. So it's one giant. It's all the same water, um, except for the goldfish tank. The goldfish tank is separate. Um, it would be kept cold. Everything else is tropical and uses the same water. So if your main um, and it had a, a deep sand or a fluidized sand filter on them. So those the pump goes out. They suck all the oxygen out in a matter of minutes. Um, and then, you know, the only way to, to auctionate those fish before, you know, adding pumps and things like that. But if you didn't have pumps, um, you could go around and dose a certain amount of, I don't know what it was, 100 mils of uh, peroxide to each of their little 10-gallon tanks. And that would keep the oxygen in there. The point is, it's not it's not like poisonous or toxic. Um, I think there's just sort of some debate as to how much the tank can handle and then how it's going to affect the coral, you know. Yeah, well... A good question i don't know i've always just stuck to that yeah, one mil per 10 is. gallons because i know it's safe and i know that's what i've done it's been the safety amount now i'm sure somebody there... can talk about it smarter than we we can um but i've never seen like i've never what i'm trying to say is i've never seen like okay don't exceed this amount per gallon or something like that you know yeah so i don't know that's my advice three percent one mil per 10 gallons safety safety zone <laughs> there Proceed. you go at your own risk outside of it, yeah. From my understanding, there could be effect or burn in the fish's gills if it's too high of a concentration. Now, it does turn to oxygen, so maybe there's, you know, 
10 minute window that i don't know but that's why i've just always right. stuck to the safe range there you go uh no um so yeah if you are resetting and doing it lots of salt water on hand if you're scrubbing stuff you want to be able to change out to clean salt water or use your old tank water and put new fresh water in the tank to kind of balance it out that's a good point you know uh when you're you're going to do this especially if you're going to leave the tank alive and not have things in a bucket and like you know it's like i said there's sort of the two approaches where you're doing it in one day or you know in stages but you're keeping the tank alive or there's the you know you're going to kill the tank and you're going to have things in holding bins so when you're doing this all in one day and just draining it down going to clean the siphon the sand bed out scrub the walls and you have every intent of filling it back up and putting the you know keeping the fish in there you got to have enough water man um because that could really it could really bite you in the ass because you work up until 10 o'clock at night you fill the tank you need 10 more gallons like you know what are you going to do if you don't have that water you know at your beck and call yep um, and I've, I've been burned by it before you know previous to owning an rodi system and mixing my own salt water days like you now mind you just 20 years ago at this point but still like it can burn you man if you're not prepared so have extra water i'd say if it's a 20 gallon tank have 25 gallons of salt water have five gallons of fresh water and having that fresh water is important too because that allows you to to um, adjust that salinity level should you mess it up because you know Sometimes you're not taking out all the water and you have some in there and then you, you know, you, depending on how much salt water you add in, you could get salinity messed up and having that fresh water on hand is important. <clears throat> I think anyway. Yeah. It's good to have both hundred percent. Right. Um, other random thing. If you are filling up, I don't know why, but I love this thing lately. That little like flood guardian thing. Yeah. The RO protector. Yeah. The aqua. Yeah. Those yeah. are cool, man. So, I don't know. Whenever I'm filling a tank, I, as I was going to bed, I'm like, it's not going to fill. I'm like, but just in case, I ran to my shed and grabbed it and hooked it up. And Yeah, man. Those things mind. are they're handy. I mean, for just to, yeah, for protecting yourself against the flood when your everyday operation of your RO, but it comes in handy for tanks. Other, other uses, like filling tanks. Yeah. And you can, I know you can put it on a timer. There you go. That's the, the trick is put it on a timer. So then it only allows your RO bin to fill when you're home. So say you're home from 5.30 in the afternoon to 10 at night, you go to bed. So you put the RO, the flood guardian on the timer. So it's only on during 5.30 to 10 PM. Mm -hmm. So that's the only possible time throughout your 24 hour day that the RO system is going to fill your bucket. So it's yeah. never on when you're not home, you know, because you know, you're, if you automate it otherwise with just a float and ASO valve, like it's going to fill whenever the, the float drops you know so you could be out shopping all day at you know on the weekend and something goes wrong and it overfills you know yeah well that's actually basically what i do for my ato container to let it refill itself is just let it run once a week or no every three days because it's on this tank that way right. it just tops itself off and only runs between you know these hours and every three or four days you know it works well that reminds me so last night i was filling my uh fresh water bin and i noticed I am not producing water at the rate it should be produced. I think I got mm -hmm. something's clogged. And I think it's the membrane because, I don't know, I haven't changed the sediment and carbon, so I'm going to do that, obviously, first. But the point is, is I'm, I'm getting 80 PSI, man, so I'm getting plenty of pressure. Oh, yeah, that's tons. But, I don't know, I, it's got to be the membrane, you know, because the pressure's coming in before it. So it's got to be the membrane that's clogged up, which kind of sucks because it's not that old, you know. <laughs> yeah. Is... But we'll see. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess it would have to be. Yeah, or bad, I mean, could or the gauge pressure gauge bad, but it's not, man. I've, I've seen, I washed the needle. It's always been it, like I know the pressure in the house and it's always been. So I don't know. There could be some other clog that I'm dealing with too. Uh, yeah. Just sort of dreading taking it apart and troubleshooting. I'm going to pull out the pre-filters and then uh, pull out the, you know, back flush it and see if that helps. And if the back flush helps um, mm -hmm. with the flush valve, or flush valve, I guess flush it. Yeah. Uh, if that helps, then I'll know it's the membrane, and I'll just order up a new membrane. That's fair. <clears throat> they're they're not yeah. that bad. I don't flush it when I should because I don't need a booster pump, and I don't have sort of a automatic flush on it. So if you do buy a booster uh, pump, that twenty bucks for the auto flush is hundred percent worth it. Oh yeah, totally. I, yes, I agree with you hundred percent. I just don't have one, mm -hmm. and I know I think I've got a manual flush kit that I just didn't install. Uh, so that's what I got to do is I'll put the the manual flush kit on it just flush it out a couple of times and then ho hopefully the production rate comes back up. Yep. Um, I burned through one, one of my two DIs too. So the first DI is like completely turned. So I'm going to, 
swap those out and I do the same thing. Do you do, you do the, the rotate second. thing with? Do you have yeah, two? rotate? The, yeah, so I'll move the second one into the first chamber. Yeah. Put a brand new one in the second chamber. No, that's uh, a good way to go. Yeah. Sort of exciting time. My first, uh, you know, RODI maintenance in the history of the tank. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, so, you know. <clears throat> so you're almost starting to become seasoned again. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, okay. So now if you're reusing a tank, are you going to reuse your sand or are you going to use new sand? Yeah, that's a, uh, it's a great discussion point. Um, I've been in a position of replacing the sand. Most of the time I'm just cleaning it. So mm -hmm. that's one of the one of the reasons I want to go in and give a tank overhaul a deep clean is because uh, just the sand is so mucky and you don't, you just want to, you get to a point where if you're just cleaning little spots, like say you do your water change, you can only get like a, 24 by 12 inch area siphoned before you've pulled out too much water mm -hmm. um and so i've been in a position where it's like man i just want to get this entire bed clean so i'm not you know because one or two weeks goes by you're just back to the same spot you know if you feel like you never get out of the hole um so yeah i've i've done it one of the biggest reasons or i guess most frequent reason i would do a overhaul like this mm -hmm. is because i want to do a, a siphon that sand bit out completely um, without having to replace it or pull it out or create a nasty mess in the, the water. Yeah. That's fair. If, if I'm going to reuse sand, um, generally I want to clean it very, very well before I put it back in. And at that point you've killed off most of the bacteria. So I'm like, ah, you might as well buy new sand. So usually I'll buy. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Now. Okay. So now if you do want to clean sand, the most e efficient, not for the water, but for you, way to do it is put it like in a five gallon bucket, put a garden hose in the very bottom of it and it will all percolate up and all the junk and poop and all that stuff will percolate all the way to the top and overflow out the top and just keep yeah, agitating a, it. That works really well to clean it. But blog, blog post, how to clean sand ho, and ho, gravel. Ho, ho, ho. Go ahead and check that out. Bullcreepspy.com slash content. <laughs> Did you write this post? Um, yes and no. No, I didn't. Um, one of the it was actually one of the old MD people uh, that made the graphics and wrote it, and then it wasn't the reason it was at the top of mind was because it was within the last six months that I went back and updated it uh, and changed some things around you know, when I put it on Bulk Reef Supply. Nice, yeah, very cool. Uh, the problem is, is I don't know who wrote it, or else I would give you a shout out because it just for a long time at Marine Depot it was um, we would just post blogs as like guest author. Mm -hmm. So it could be one of a handful of people that actually wrote this. Yep. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking it was either Steven or uh, John. Nice. Just based on the images. <laughs> you recognize their style? What they go yeah, for? Yeah, it? It it's more like I know John, I think, made these images. And then, uh, yeah, it was, it's just the time frame. I think it was John or Steven. Okay, that's cool. Uh, Diamond Goby will clean your sand all day. They are awesome sand cleaners, but sometimes they also sandstorm your corals. That one's a trade-off. Yeah, and they, you know, sometimes they just don't do well, man. They'll starve for whatever reason. Um, I've had them both fat and I've had them skinny. Uh, you just, you often see them skinny in tanks. Um, well, but they, you know, you I guess to... if you have the problem yeah. with a dirty sand bed, they're not going to be skinny. No, exactly. And I think, too, they need a decent-sized tank, right? So they have tons of sand to go through. And the tank, you know, you probably want to be, you know, six months old, so there's lots of junk in the sand bed for them to eat. And they'll, you know, like, there's something to be said about stripping your sand bed too clean, you know? Now, do you think that is an issue with, you know, fish and sand bed sifters? Like, do you think they can make it too clean? Like, I had a big debate with Mark Levinson back yeah. in the day, I remember about this. It was over um, the sand sifting starfish, where he, he was like, gung-ho that they would like make it way too clean and kill your whole sand bed when i've had like two in a tank for years i'm like nah it's fine but so what do you think so i've never had a tank where i thought the sand bed was too clean mm -hmm. um but i've also seen i've also seen them star like sand sand sifting starfish starve like i've seen that that happen i've seen the the diamond goby star um so is that the definition of too clean because you don't have the food for the animals in your tank? Um, I don't think you're ever, you know, this biome testing would be a great answer to this question because we'll know, okay, it's, the tank's alive and the fish are fine, but you're definitely nowhere near as biodiverse. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that I think it does affect neg negatively is sort of the, 
not bacteria, um, the, the microorganisms like pods and different things like that and worms, um, the stuff that's, you know, part of a reef tank and certainly adds to the, the overall ecosystem. Um, I think those are the things that you'll strip out of the tank. And how does that affect the tank negatively or positively? I just think it takes away from the food source for fish that will naturally yep. go feed upon them. And, you know, if you don't have a place for pods to grow, they're just not going to grow in your tank, right? True. Now, something's constantly eating them. Now, on the flip side, pods are also like miniaturized cleanup clue, right? Like they're going right. to be eating these little bits of food and little bits of teeny bits of stuff all over the thing. Like that's their food source. So they are in a roundabout way cleanup crew as well, as well as free fish food. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> do you, okay, if you redo a tank or do it, would you reintroduce pods or would you just let them naturally find their way in over time? I'd probably, I mean, it just sort of depends, I suppose. Um like what the position was like, I would definitely like, I would keep my refugium alive. I would try to. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, as long as I did that, then I would be pretty confident. Like, okay, I don't need to reintroduce them again. Um, but if I was doing, you know, if I let the rock die and sand die or replaced it out, I would probably reintroduce them again just for the sake of doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it just sort of depends on the situation where I'm at, you know, that's fair. Um, other consideration, if you're redoing a bunch of stuff in your tank is you don't want to necessarily stir up that sand too much, especially if you never, ever clean it. Yeah, that was something, uh, you know, you can put it, you can get a nasty storm in your tank of detritus, um, so much that so it'll, it'll choke out the fish, um, and kill, I mean, it can kill them and clog up their gills. Okay. Um, so yeah, you know, if you, if you don't clean your sand bed and you you know, just even the lightest agitation of your sand bed creates a nasty cloud storm. Um, do it in series, man. Just go in. You can do 50%. So you can take a lot of water out and really get it, you know, clean it. But have a gravel vac ready and siphon that nasty water out immediately rather than try to stir it up and just drain the tank, you know? Mm -hmm. so yeah. That can, be, that can be gross stuff. Now, on this is on a note around the sand bed. If you are cleaning your sand bed, um, you should do it like once in a while but don't clean the whole thing at once um only just pick a chunk of it because you don't want to disturb too much of it at the same time that's another consideration you know if you do a weekly water change you know maybe pick you know 10 or 20 percent of it you know each week and just rotate it around so yeah, and you end up with a, you you know the, the sand bed stays clean that way as long as you're persistent um i think where people run into trouble it's like well every time i change the water i clean my sand well okay how, how often you change your water well every four to six weeks you know like that's the hard part is keeping the routine. Like it's not the cleaning of your sand with every water change. It's doing your water change every two weeks or whatever of the routine. So that's the, the key to this is the routineness and doing it, you know, alternating those spots on a very regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, and reality is most of us aren't super strict with that schedule. So you're going to end up, you know, doing larger areas or having, you know, having to significantly pay more attention to cleaning the sand bed to actually keep it pristine and white. Oh, I'm so um, overdue. <laughs> yeah, and if you see those tanks where it's like, man, look at that sand bed. And it's like, that guy must be, you know, all kinds of work. Well, and that's what they do is they're meticulous about that routine, and they clean that sand bed every single time. But it's the frequency that they do it that's important, I think. Now, what are your thoughts about manually doing it versus having a bunch of, like, you know, conches or sea cucumbers or other creatures to do it for you? So I'm a Nessarius snail fan. I like mm -hmm. the, the Nessarius snail to stir things up down there. So that's always been one that I think is super beneficial. Um, the conches, I've, I've, I've had a couple of those. I like they're, they're just neat to have. Mm -hmm. um, I, but in every single tank, I'm still, I get stuff on the sand. Usually it's like a form of di diatoms or like a, a film algae. Um, or of course, cyano if it shows up. But generally speaking, I think in every tank I've had, I've always dealt with something going on in the sand um i don't know it's a very rare occasion maybe in only one or two nano tanks that i've owned which had maybe six square inches of you know sand space mm -hmm. um have i been able to keep like a perfectly clean sand bed you know yeah um so it's hard right. to say what what the trick is 100 percent. you know it's probably a combo of both but i would i would i would be leaning to think that manual cleaning is far more effective at keeping it like pristine white mm -hmm. than having, um, you know, herbivores or, or, or cleanup animals. And I think the best approach is 
obviously doing both, you know? Yeah. Owen, oh, my t- my sand never looked cleaner since adding a chalk goby. Bonus eats chalk frozen flake. Goby or chalk basslet? I've seen chalk basslet. I don't know what a chalk goby is, though. Unless it means the same yeah. thing. But they're cool looking fish. I don't know. Chalk, yeah, the basslet are neat. Yeah, chalk. Is there a different one? Uh, I think it's just a white version of the diamond goby, the all white one. Oh. Oh, right, right, right. Blue. I think it's got some blue on it. Blue on its cheeks. But I have a nice, pristine white sand bed beside me now, so I'm actually going to have to. Figure out the game plan and keep it pristine. Keep it up. That's and you got a lot of sand bed space in there with being you flat and open, right? Yeah. I'm gonna get lots of sand cleaners to do it for me. But yeah, we'll, we'll and see. the shallow bed. So that's something I've I've been leaning on for many years now too. Is just the one inch sand bed that makes your life so much easier, man. Especially when it comes to cleaning, and mm-hmm. you can keep it cleaner that way. When you start getting in two inches beyond, like that's just a whole another inch of detritus you're collecting and having to pull out. Um, mm-hmm. So as long as you keep it at a one inch bed or less, you're you're benefiting yourself when it comes to cleaning the the tank in general. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rowage Gaming. Do you think a smaller tank with a sand bed can provide stability for a larger bare bottom if they're plumbed to the same stuff? Yes, I do. Um, sand bed holds a ton of bacteria space. Like each one of those granules is a lot of surface area. So you're going to have a lot more bacteria in your tank with a sand bed than in a bare bottom. So I, I say yes. And sharing the same water, they're sharing the stability in a sense. So Yeah, so for sure. I, I 100% think they do. Now, you could add just like a ton of, you know, porous meat in your sump to kind of make up for it, but Sandbed definitely does. Wondering, hoping the UC Tropical Elbone will help clean keep the... Oh, that's that really cool looking one. You posted one, it was like like blue and colorful, like one of those elbow, elbow bony. Abalone? Abalone, thank you. That's the word. <laughs> Old baloney? I know. I've never seen <laughs> oh. colorful. I just see them at like seafood markets and stuff, and they're always like these big things on the glass. Wait, there's a colorful one? Yeah, here else. Is it, like, you're talking about like the inside of the shell? Like they have like sort of that pearlescent shell. You can find the photo. Blue abalone, maybe? Uh, maybe. Because like the. The shells are pearlescent on the inside, but the outside just looks like a rock. Aaron posts, I sent a photo on Instagram. I'll find it later. All right, cool. He ordered two from Unique Corals. Huh, apparently Unique Corals is selling some. Oh, well, there we go. There you go. Ooh, there are some pretty pretty shells. <laughs> That's a good glimmaging. Yeah, man. Uh, used to have them. So it used to be, able, like, off the coast of California, they, they're they were real popular, and they kind of got fished out, but... You could die for them um, mm-hmm. and, ha- and hand collect them. And I remember growing up in the 80s and early 90s, man, the guys would use them as ashtrays and stuff like that. And big, like oh, huge. Know, eight, in- eight inch diameter, yeah. Yeah. And we eat them. I remember eating them too. Are they any good? Yeah, they're good. It's just mm. like a, a, I guess closer to a calamari than I would say a clam. Yeah. Crazy. It's always weird seeing like some of these creatures and like, you know, Asian supermarket or somewhere in the seafood section. Okay. Have you ever considered yourself like, hmm, I wonder if I could put that in my tank? Most of them are cold oh, like water. The so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess the thoughts crossed my mind, but okay. For I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, not seriously. Now, on that note, um, copper band but- butterfly. One of if they're having trouble getting to eat, one of the biggest things I found that works is getting Manila clams. Now. I've bought frozen ones like on ice from a seafood market and I'd throw them in the freezer and I'd use those to get copper bands eating. And it worked very well. And when I originally got the one in my frag tank, you know, I was doing that and one of the shells would stay closed up and the thing was living in it for like a month. Where mm-hmm. all the other ones, you know, they just became snacks. So that guy was just living life in the frag tank. So, yeah, pretty crazy. I think they're at uh, Unique Corals that have these tropical abalones. I remember reading this article about it. Yeah. Um, We'll just thrive in the tank. They're good eaters. They're actually a hybrid. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. So it'd be cool. They're supposed to be really good cleaners, so it could be good. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I mean, I've had abalone. There's, you know, you can get little tiny ones or um, one of those other ones that they, you can mistake them for an abalone, but it's a, it's a stone, stomatella. Oh, the guys that like suck. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's stomatella. And then there's another one, um, not a limpet, but there's another one that's like moda, like moves. Um, but it gets this like black, 
like the foot of it like wraps around the top of the shell. Maybe mm-hmm. it is a limpet. And like, mm-hmm. you know, it wraps around its neck. And they're not supposed to be healthy, those ones that like the foot is black and it wraps around the top of it. God, I wish I knew the name of it. But I, I remember pulling one of those out of a tank years ago. And man, that was, I mean, it was three, four inches in diameter mm-hmm. in a 55 gallon tank. And I just asked, you know, I was like, oh, man, how long has that thing been in the tank? Like, I, you know, I built a tank. With a, it was a friend of mine. We built a tank like three years prior. And I was like, man, this thing must have been growing in here ever since we built the tank, you know? Oh, carry. Yeah, carries are cool. Those, those are the ones where they have like the their skin wraps around the outside of the shell. Carry snails. I have one in my tank. Yeah, that's a... Or money carry, I think, is the one that I have. Yeah, there's a few different types. There's a tiger, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty crazy how they do that. It's like yeah, this little like, leathery body armor goes over the thing. Chiton. Yeah. yeah, that's the other one. C-H-I-T-O-N. Chiton. 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 I have, ter- I have terrible pronouncing these things. But yeah, um, I think those are the other ones that kind of like suck to the rock that you see. All- um, what is the manufacturer of the shallow tank? I had it custom made from Concept Aquariums. Yeah, seven foot six, 28 front to back, and 14 deep. So I had a custom made. But yeah, it was Concept Aquariums in Calgary, Alberta, in Canada, if you're in Canada. Wow. Cowries have a lot of cool looking shells, man. They do, right? Tons. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. All right. What else? What else? Do we miss anything big on kind of making over a tank? Tank overhaul. Fresh, so we talked about all the, all the reasons. So neglect the tank, swap out the sand. You want to rearrange the rocks. I don't think we talked yep. about that. Like, um, And this is something that's happened to me before is where corals grow in. You know, you've had your tank for maybe two years. You got some SPS running into each other. You've got this LPS that's, you know, is encroaching this new Fabia frag you got that cost a bajillion dollars. You don't want to lose it. Um, And I've been in that position where it's like, all right, I just got to rip the tank apart. I will clean it in the meantime, but then I'll frag. I can move things around and place corals um, more logically to where you can keep them all without running into problems of, you know, aggression between the corals. And I think that, honestly, that's the biggest reason what or, or right, rocks falling over and just That's wanting fair. to rearrange it and open it up um i remember in first couple of years I, I, of keeping reef tanks i always found myself after a couple of years into it i'd be like man just pulling a rock out of the tank made so much difference in terms of opening the tank up for aquascape or the aquascape up for both the fish but then also the appearance of it is you just we have a tendency to use a lot more rock and it probably was more common back in the day when it was, you know, always use a pound and a half or two pounds per gallon or pound mm. per gallon, you know, whatever it was. Okay. Mm. Um, now, yeah. the, the funny thing that makes me laugh is when they're talking about weight. I don't know if you saw it, but I posted. Uh, like how much is water? No, but did you, I did an Instagram post last night when I was escaping okay. and one of the mm-hmm. little aquaphorous chunks of rock that broke off is like, boop, boop, boop. it's like a bobber. The thing is so porous. It's like how much air is inside of it. It was literally yeah. just like bobbing around. It's like, well, right. that's a light rock. Definitely porous. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Like pumice stone, I think does that. Yeah. But it, I don't know if it's volcanic rock, what it is, but it's super porous. But anyways, it just made me laugh because it was like almost floating. It was so light. It was like barely yeah. touching. But the it has more surface area than you know, a, a chunk of Marco rock of the same size, you know, um, mm-hmm. or mi- mined yeah. aragonite rock um, of the same size. So, so yeah, that makes sense. Another big thing for a bit of a tank makeover is you have a bunch of boring rock, like you just have a bunch of boulders, basically, and you mm-hmm. want to make a cool aquascape. Now, the one consideration if you're changing out all your rock is you're losing all that good bacteria surface area if you take it out. So in those type of situations, ideally, you could put that... Uh, Big chunk of that rock in your sump somewhere so the water's still flowing through it you're going to keep the bacteria at least for cycle or cure the new rock new aquascape that you have prior to doing the swap out um or switch it so yep. where you put your new your new dry scape right in the display and then take all your rock from your display and stick it down in the sump or somewhere else in the system because as long as it's in the water you're yep. still getting the benefit of that bacteria and um, you can slowly remove it over time exactly so, you know one rock every other week out of the sump the one in your display will slowly you know establish itself and then i would probably add since you've likely reduced a lot of the surface area going from a lot of rock to a little bit of rock Mm -hmm. then add add some of the the super porous biomedia down in the sump um at the same time 
Exactly. Or, or, or cycle a bunch of media prior. Yeah. So then when you pull the rock out, you, you, at least you've still got that media, you know? I'm also a big fan of just dumping in bottle bacteria as well, just to help with that extra nitrification cycle. I think that's a good rule, general rules. Anytime you rip it apart and fill it back <laughs> up, you know, you're putting yep. more than 90% new water in the tank is to, to give it a, a dose of uh, Dr. Tim's or MB7, you know? Mm, exactly. Yeah, I know. Yeah, okay, so Aaron said it is volcanic rock. Which well, is the aquifer forest rock, and that's why I use it in this tank. First time using it, yeah. but yeah, so it's, it's, it's natural, like it's raw, it's like collected, not made. Um, I think it's made with volcanic. Just looking at some of the structures, like it looks, got it. Like they use something to, you know, shape it, but they use like chunks of volcanic, and then probably right, a bit yeah. of like, you know, like a stone fix type of deal to like create randomish shapes out of it. That's my vibe from it. I'm not a hundred percent. Aaron, fill us in. Um, oh yeah, I see. I see it. It's like they make a like a mortar mix and pour it. Kind of. That that's like my guess. Shape it, yeah. But yeah, it was it, it was surprisingly light, which was kind of cool. No, that so. is awesome. That's neat. Mm -hmm. Easier to work with and scape and glue together too. Yeah, exactly. I, glue doesn't need to be as strong if it's lighter weight, you know. I didn't. Like I... I'm thinking a pumice, like it's really lightweight stone. If your scape was our Brightwell export. You know, if your scape was made out of all of that material, I mean, it would be fragile and, you know, yeah, yeah but it would be a lot easier to glue together and maintain taller, yeah. intricate structures, you know. I somehow managed to not glue a single rock yet. Not glue one? Yeah. yeah. Well, for me, it's crazy because I normally do crazy weird things. So, but yeah, no, so far I haven't. I might I always more. end we'll up see. moving rocks around, man. A anytime yeah. I've built a scape, like, okay, I'm going to take all this time and build a cool scape. And I do it. A year and a half later, I'm busting it out and moving it around. Because, I mean, the corals, they grow, and, like, I have to accommodate the skate to that. And so, you know, every you know, these corals get, get big, and I don't, you know, I'm not going to take the coral out, and most of the time I don't want to cut, like, large chunks off. So um, True. I'll, I'll remove rocks and accommodate the aquascape to, to complement the coral. Um, I want to collect more and add more, so... So add, add more rock got more space all of a sudden <laughs> yeah the addiction is real um doo -doo -doo -doo. yeah so it's yeah i don't know i think it's pretty close I, I might tweak it a little bit more but i think i'm pretty close what are you gonna tweak i don't know i do that hey i did this Nothing. i did this in a couple hours one night which is really good for me because my last one in the water box i spent like weeks on it mind you i don't have the tank yet so i had weeks but I spent like weeks and every day I just keep changing it and changing it and changing I'm an, it. I'm a champion of get it done in a day. Yeah. Especially when it comes to like scape and fill the tank and turn the pump on. Yes. Like, I did that all When I day. put my mind to it, man, I'm putting water in that thing and the pump is turning on that day. Yep. Um, now, whether it gets stocked and anything else gets turned on, like that's a different story. Yeah. That's fair. In the day I put rock and salt water in the thing, like I want, I want that pump on and I want it cycling like as soon as possible. Do you normally do you normally do water first, or do you do rock first, or? Um, I've done it both ways, but I, I mean, the smart way is put your rock in, put your sand in, mm -hmm. slowly fill it up with salt water, and then turn it on. Um, but I have mixed salt water in the display. Yeah. I had dry sand, dry rock, filled it with RO water, mixed the salt in there, and then turn it on. Um, okay. So I've done it both those ways. But it's been quite some time since I tried to, like, scape a wet tank with, like, water half in it, you know. It makes up your mess, man. You just... That, that's what I did this time. Nor normally, normally, I would just mix salt water in a barrel and pump it in afterwards. But yeah. because my office is not that big and there's already two tanks of temporary, I'm like, and probably a ton of extra weight in here, I'm like, yeah, I better not add another drum of water in the room when I can barely move it already. So... I pre-filled it with water and then scaped it and then I had sand once I had it on the rock pretty much where I wanted it. Did you use it? Did you use like a, a siphon tube or a pipe to add the sand in or did you just dump it in there? Just and dumped it in. Call it a day? Live sand? Um, there is wet bottles of bacteria in it. Okay, so it was like a, yeah. a rag alive or something? Yeah, so it I was, did. It, there was, the sand was wet or moist when you poured it in, right? No, it was dry. Um, oh, it was dry. Yeah, so it, I had two bags of the aquaphor sand and i had a bag of the carob sea sand because i didn't have enough sand 
And then, but the Aquaforce one came with little bottles of like Part A and B of like bacteria basically to dump in to make it live. So I just yeah. dumped it into the tank soup afterwards with the power heads um, on. Ryan or Andy or Ryan specifically, I think, is doing some really cool stuff with cycling and bacteria <laughs> right now. Um, yes. Excited to see. Like he keeps posting little tidbits and because it's a, I don't know, it's been a few months now, but it's going to be a, a long process. But they're testing different approaches to cycling. That's cool. Um, and I remember I think they're trying out some of the the Aquaforest bacteria. Um, I think it's like a series of supplements, isn't it? I'm not 100 percent familiar with it, but point is there's going to be a cool outcome of that and ideally we'll learn a little bit more about cycling and best nice. ways to approach it you know i am there's been some interesting observations i can tell you that much well I'll spill the beans i'm interested <laughs> <laughs> well check it out ryan posts about it okay. on his on facebook is where i see him post about it ryan mm -hmm. bachelor on facebook nice. um but they'll make videos on it all when when it's all said and done oh for sure i i'm a big fan of the bacteria soup which is tons of different types of bacteria um, now, if you're cycling a tank from scratch, the one consideration is some bacteria can potentially try and outcompete each other. So it's also can be wise to stagger when you add different ones. But in general, I like to add just tons of different bacteria sources. Yeah, I used four, I think, different brands on the tank when I cycled it this time because I was taking that same approach. Mm -hmm. um, I think what did it, something we don't talk about, it was like, okay, add it, that's fine. But I continued, like, I didn't stop. So mm -hmm. like I, I staggered them initially through the four or five weeks of cycle, letting it cycle. Um, but then after I started adding livestock, like I continued a regular maintenance dose of, I was using Microbacter 7. Mm -hmm. uh, and for whatever reason, man, I, I really think that helped through what somebody might call the ugly stage or like, I never got a nasty dino outbreak. I mean, diatoms, but I mean, it's just so mild, you know, like never any nasty, like it just wasn't, a deal and it wasn't it wasn't something to even talk about or mention um and i don't you know i, I like to think that having that regular maintenance dose of bacteria during that time frame um only helped in that area you know i certainly know it helps with adding new fish and ensuring there's plenty of bacteria there you know no nope. very 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 true i agree with you on that one any questions for us dev yeah bunch of random we, chat different stuff we reached our limit i think i think we had a pretty good spread today if you guys got any questions on stuff we didn't answer let us know sorry for the most exciting topic ever hey <laughs> it's relevant to for me at least this week yeah no i got you that good was, luck with it thanks i'm pretty happy with that coming exciting time at least you got stuff to put in already too you got all your zoanthids waiting for you yeah, no, I got other, I got a bunch of random stuff there. There, There's still a few things got to deal with. Like, I have this one cool rock with chalices and stuff on it, but there's a bunch of those little 2B worm creature things on the side I got to deal with somehow. Break them all off. Back. Yeah, the vermitid snails. Those yeah. Suck. I yeah, those I know. I got I the really one, do. Two, the two rocks that have tons of corals that I like on it, so I need to somehow deal with it. I just I got to deal with game bubble, plan. bubble algae, man. I got bubble algae growing on my macroalgae <laughs> um vibrant actually, not, like vibrant worked well on that one vibrant yeah i'm hesitant I dude know. i'm scared i'm scared of something like that um the tank's so nice looking now too i'll, I'll just I'll, I'll overhaul it man i'll just rip everything out and, mm -hmm. and i've done it a couple times now but it gets on my pumps and it's like that little bubble algae like they're small bubbles not big ones yep um and yeah it's, just, it's spreading man it's spreading i put one in but i don't think it lived because I haven't seen it in... They're good hiders. The they definitely yeah, are. Yeah, I, I know. And I haven't seen it since the day I put it in. Uh, I thought I'm going to try. I'm going to add one or two more before I go in and start, you know, scrubbing the entire rock one at a time and mm -hmm. peroxiding it to kill it, you know. Um, but they're just, it's, you know, how it goes. It just starts in the crevices. Any place you cannot reach easily, it just spreads, yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you decide to do the the vibrant route, it did work. I did it at my old nano. It took about six weeks, but it got rid of all my bubble algae. So I'm on a last resort for sure, dude. I yeah. know, I know. People say it's got great results, uh, but I I love my coral too much, and the tank looks good, and I'm just scared. <laughs> I'm scared mm -hmm. something something's gonna come of it, or you know, like there's a difference between a tank that's like looks okay and a tank that looks great. I think I'm in the like looks great zone in terms of the health of my coral. Yeah. And I, I don't want to go into the looks okay zone or like, well, they're alive and 
it's kind of like they're looking good relatively speaking it's like no man i won't mind looking good because mm-hmm. they're healthy and happy and big and growing you know um so that's the only thing that hesitates uh, just i feel like it throws some sort of balance off yeah, that's i fair. could be completely wrong because i you know i've never dosed it extensively on a tank of my own so well that's the risk with a lot of these hammer approaches right is you're you know you're killing off something nasty but you're probably killing out some of the good as well right so it is going to mess yeah. with your balance for at least a little while yeah for sure man and yeah. that's that's what i want to avoid and i can do it man i've overcome a lot of these things i can do it i just need to do it <laughs> mm-hmm. it's good no it's true okay producer reef how are you loving your g5 pros do you like them better color wise than the blues i so i I had a I had a single blue for a while and then I decided to go with all the pros. Um, I personally like the pros better because I like a little bit of that whiter crisper look over just all blues all the time. Um, so I like the pros better. You can get the same look out of the blues and the pros for the most part, like pretty dang close. Like side by side, you probably wouldn't. Notice. The only advantage with the blues, if you like that AB plus super duper, you know, blue, more bluey look, you can get more juice at that spectrum. But if you don't run them at 100%, if you run it, you know, 80%, you can probably get them pretty dang close either way. So personally, I like the pros because I find you get, can get a really nice, crisp look out of your tank and still have that really vibrant color where it's not... When the tank is too blue, sometimes I find... Like at nighttime, I notice that like there's like the hawkfish and certain fish that just look like this like dark blob because you're not getting that color rendition from them. Or when it's crispy, then they pop out. Like it, that, that's kind of there's lots of little things like that. Why I was just, like going with the pros. Are you are you, are you the blue or the whiter? Argue. Yeah. I, no, I would I would choose the pro. Okay, for sure. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a pro I've guy. always liked a like a 10k or a 14k back mm-hmm. metal how metal highlight days, and then even with T5s, man, um, I would keep the tank wider and only do the heavy blue at dawn dusk um i did that for many years dude where it was like super uv blue for two hours in the morning then it got real white through the afternoon and then super blue bu for or uv blue mm-hmm. uh through the two hours in the evening so i do like a long ramp up and a long ramp down mm-hmm. but for the six to eight hours in the, of the the peak of the photo period was like a wider daylight like a 10 to 14k yeah um, i do something very similar i don't so. like it you know fish look better um i I couldn't it's hard for me to tell you like what it's gonna i think it has to do with what species of coral it is um but like you know which is going to be better for your coral uh as long as you stay within the the full spectrum with the peaks in the right places um you'll be good you know it's it's up well you'll be you'll be good in terms of health your coral but just leave it up to your personal opinion like what looks good to you you know like what do you want to see in the tank so the other consideration is the color you see is what's reflected back at you. So having more color channels and different color diodes give you a wider range of the spectrum that you can put on the coral and thus is reflected back at you. So you're giving yourself basically a wider palette of colors you can enhance. Sure, makes sense. Yeah, that's how I like to think of it. Everyone's talking about food, trying to make me hungry. Yay. <laughs> I, I smell food. Oh, sounds delicious. I think my family's cooking out there, yeah. So I'm going to go do that. All right, buddy. It's about that time. Thanks for yeah, coming we'll on, as always. Yeah, we'll see you next month. Um, hey. I'm going to be gone the first week of January. we got the holiday coming. Everybody, happy holidays out there. Yep, happy, happy holidays. Happy holidays, Devin. Happy holidays, Robert. Wonderful, wonderful holiday. Yeah, thank you. Um, but I'll be gone the first week of January. So if anything, uh, the later half of January. We'll, we'll see do all that. you reef duders then. All right, mid-January. I'll see you back. All right, bye, bud. All right, guys. Yep, Robert. All right, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed tonight's live stream. A little bit random today, but it was a little bit on point and topic with going through and redoing the frag tank into a display. So I am excited to see where it comes, and I'm excited to have another display because, honestly, I think it's be way more fun than a frag tank. And I didn't really sell frags anyways, especially during pandemics and everything else. So display just kind of makes more sense, and I think it'll be fun. But yeah, I will probably, I've been filming as I do the scape and everything else on it. And yeah, so that will probably be next Monday's video, and I'll probably film some more before then. 
So hopefully you guys enjoyed today's stream. As, as always, if you did hit that like button, if you need to make sure you subscribe. Thanks for hanging out, and I'll see you guys on next week's video, next week's live stream.